Hi everyone. Yay, we're here. <laughs> Makes me happy. Uh, good. <laughs> then uh, welcome. And uh, we'll just sit a bit for the beginning, okay? And uh, <clears throat> I don't know. It's not really necessary to orient ourselves because where are we? We're always in the deep field of the universe. But um, sometimes it's nice to do nothing for a bit and see what appears. And that's meditation. So to begin, uh, you know, I suppose we always begin with here. What's here? What's it like to feel my own life here? And without, uh, I suppose without prejudice, really, to step out of the ways we think about ourselves and our life and the people we know and and uh, and just feel your life right now. The big thing, feeling our lives, enjoying ourselves really, <laughs> with the here-ness of being here. <clears throat> You know, you're in this, if you look around your temple, you're in this, your own temple was just for you for this moment. The walls, the roof, the trees, if you're outside, the flowers, the chair. We showed up in the universe and this happened. One of the old teachers says, it's for you, honored one. <laughs> so indeed it is. And so just to feel it, feel the time. And all the things, all the multiplicity of things that make up your life. That is perhaps not essential to fuss with them enough. Let, let your life organize itself for the time of the meditation. Or not organize itself. <laughs> it's good enough without you reaching and stri without you reaching and striving. What a strange and marvelous thing not to reach and strive. Just to be here. And you can tell how, you can just feel it, like right now, if you just feel it, there's nothing required of you. And it's a joyful thing, you know, um, whatever you decide your life is for, <clears throat> to come together, in med just to do meditation, it itself opens many gates and doors. But to come together and do meditation, then we realize the connections among us and between us. And nobody has to look down on anybody or look up to anybody, because... <clears throat> We're all connected in a mysterious way, and we just have to think, well, that's enough. Just like a bird call, it's enough. Or the sound of traffic, you know, the sunlight striking through the window, it's enough. And so the, if you want to call on, uh, well, 
one of the cons about the way we're all, all linked, or the way we're both unique and linked, uh, each branch of coral holds up the moon. Each branch of coral holds up the moon. And so you tell that in the moonlight, <clears throat> wherever you look, in the ocean, in the water, where there's coral, you know, there's a moon wherever you look. Thousands of moons, and it's all your moonlight. Each piece of moon is yours. And something to do with you. So the thing with the great koans is, uh, <clears throat> in a way not to jump past them and figure them out or if you need to do that that's okay but um, what I've found is just let it come to me and act upon me it's like it's feeling the time feeling the koan this beautiful poem really fragment of the universe a fragment of a poem each branch of coral holds up the moon And just be willing to be here with you, where well, you are you. Just be, being willing to be here without knowing a lot about what you're doing here. I have a practice is a marvelous thing because it's not described by anything else we care about or wish for. It's not smaller than anything else. It's not for anything else. It's just for you. Each branch of coral holds up the moon. <laughs> and I've been, I've been, um, I've been struck like many people have um, by the the. Um, the James Webb deep field. Um, they say that this, these are <clears throat> these are not stars; these are galaxies. <laughs> and they say if you take a piece of a grain of sand and hold it eye level against the sky, it's pretty much what's contained <laughs> contained here at arm's length. And. Uh, and just the sheer variety and multiplicity is wonderful. It, it's like creatures, you know, the, the whole, uh, all the galaxies. These are ones, and these are ones we've never seen before because of very deep field from the James Webb telescope that had to open its wings, really, open its solar collectors, these vast, you know, solar collectors in order to power itself in deep space and then send back these shots so I don't know and I thought of uh, I thought of uh, Van Leeuwenhoek the person who first you know, microscopes were invented in the, I think the 16th century but he was a 17th century you know amateur scientist you know Dutch and um, and he first saw, he put things under the microscope and saw blood, little cells, little cockles, he called them, in the blood or in the plant, in the plant material. And, uh, and little, he saw the tiny little um, beings swimming around, foraminifera, foraminifera. Forminifera are uh, swimming around, and um, and he called them little, you know, shell, little shellfish, you know, like little shellfish in the world. Everything is made of little shellfish, you know. <laughs> Everything is made of little galaxies, you know, and uh, as sort of a marvelous kind of thing, you know, and uh, it's galaxies all the way down, as they say, you know. <laughs> This is rather wonderful. It's called Stefan's Quintet. Although I only really see, I think that really bright, 
thing must be a one of the quintet, but um, he has marvelous universes. This is a universe containing many universes, though. So there we are, and uh, and I think one of the big things in the Zen Chan awakening is that we realize that all the little pieces make up a totality and we're part of as well as being a little piece made up of little cockles or whatever we're made up of tiny little bits then we also connected to in some way participate in and have a place in the vastness and uh, you know the I sent this out in the newsletter, but it's always it's worth. It's such a great thing. It's always worth. Uh, Su Dong Bo was was a a great um, late by Chinese standards, you know, uh, a Song Dynasty after the Great Golden Age, after civil wars and bad emperors had torn China apart. Uh, he was at. A, he would stay. I don't know that people were rather loose about the notion of religion in those days, but, you know, intelligent people would tend to stay at Zen temples when they were traveling, you know, poets and, and, and people like that. And so people felt of themselves to be part of the Chan world without necessarily, you know, not being other things like Taoists or something. And he had a, he had a great awakening while staying at this temple. And he wrote a poem on the wall of the temple, and that's then he walked off, and just that was his. <laughs> he didn't publish it. He didn't. Know, well, that's a publishing, I guess. Poem on the wall of the temple, great tradition in Chan, and the first two lines refer to Shakyamuni, the Buddha. The sound of the stream is his long, broad tongue. The colors of the mountains, his body. This night has eighty-four thousand verses. How will I remember them tomorrow? And uh, and it's the kind of thing that just keeps coming back to me, you know, when I'm sitting at night these days. We're having a kind of nice so far. The fire season hasn't really ramped up towards the coast where I live in California. So we've got these um, the from the Humboldt Current coming south from the Bering Sea past past our, our little county, um, the cold fogs get drawn in in the evening and drip all night and keeps the redwoods going. And, uh, and so I sit out at night just listening to the dripping, really. It's not really raining, but it's not really not raining. It's going drip, drip, drip. <laughs> and then you hear the foxes, the raccoons, deer crashing about, you know, you hear all sorts of things and hear a strange cough that you're not sure you want to inquire into too much, you know, and <laughs> and, uh, and things like that. And who knows what it is, you know, it's probably it might be anybody. And uh, and so we had this one, and then birds moving about that have no business moving about at night, and then the owl calling and another owl responding, you know. So we're really in the, this is, um, this is our quintet. This is our galaxy we're in. I'm in that, and you're in whatever you're in. Maybe you're dreaming, and you're lying on your, in your sheets, and just asleep, you know. And that's the piece of the universe, too. That's the fragment that you have at that moment. And so, uh, sitting out there, then it occurred to me, um, and then at dawn, you know, the hummingbirds start to, they're on the go because they, they need it. <clears throat> an enormous amount of fuel to keep them going in flight the way they are. And and I noticed that particularly then when everything else is quiet and there's their wing sounds are quite different from each other, you know. There's a big one that has incredibly loud click 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 wing sounds and you know I, I, I thought about should I worry for it, but then it didn't seem any point in that. <laughs> so I didn't. I just decided to just enjoy its wings. And then there's little ones that, whoo, just a little whirr you're used to. But um, it was like everything becomes, you see the the little cockles in the bloodstream. You see the the minutiae of life. And so then I, I was thinking about the sound of the stream is his long, broad tongue, the colors of the mountains, his body. And then I thought about the garden and 
and Kuan Yin instead of Shakyamuni, gold light inside the dawn fog. Isn't that her calm face? Everywhere these roses climbing are her graceful body. It's a kind of summer poem. And, uh, and, and I think the thing uh, is that, you know, it's, it's not a mistake to be here. You know, Kuan Yin is here, Buddha is here, and your own heart is here. There's, there's no other. You're not going to find Buddha or Kuan Yin somewhere else, you know, and, and uh, the blessing of that. To call on the, ne the, the Chinese and Japanese have a thing about um, to call, if you're really caught in some dark, dark place, if you call on the name of Avalokiteshvara even once, you will be transported, you know. So <laughs> one moment, as uh, Hakuan says, one moment of Zazen frees you from all your crimes. And uh, it was kind of nice. I have a friend who's sort of really kind of a bit literal minded, and he said, you know, for example, that's a good example of meditation instruction that's not true. And uh, I said, no, it's true. <laughs> One moment of Zazen, there are no, you know, right now, like take it right now, the moment of Zazen. There are no crimes, There's, there are no mistakes right now, just feel it. Or you can argue with me if you want, argue with your mind, and even that is the now. <laughs> He's wrong again. You know? it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> so, yeah, he just says this stuff. I don't know, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And so I'd be, and I, I'd be just be noticing those little minute particles that life's made up of. And uh, here's a great thing. And like, um, I'm a fan of Juan Vioro wrote a, a book about Mexico City called Horizontal Vertigo, which is a rather wonderful idea that you get vertigo just from vertigo from the the craziness of the crazy, you know, ness of it. And he said he said the way he can't you can't even navigate around Mexico City in his view, you know. And uh, and since he lives there and has lived there his whole life and he won't leave, then and he says it's true that Waze and Google Maps can save us but with the proliferation of streets with the same name, both apps can take you to the wrong place. The user must also know the name of the neighborhood, but even that is not conclusive. I live in a neighborhood with two official names, Via Cuyoacan and Cuyoacan Center. Despite that, the Uber operating system gives it a third name, Santa Catarina. <laughs> The street is named after one of the strong men of the Mexican Revolution. This means the name reappears on the furthest outposts of the city. Following the two, uh, this is an old thing now, following the 2017 Rohi Guide, the metropolitan area contains 412 streets, roundabouts, and avenues named Carranza. <laughs> to get to my house, you have to reject 411 options located in other zones. <laughs> <laughs> and know beforehand the three different names the app, app subscribe to my neighborhood. Besides all that, the Waze programs are not always up to date on the sudden uses we make of space. After a wave of muggings, the neighborhood, neighbors gather one fed up Wednesday and put up a gate to keep outsiders from entering their street. <laughs> but with the same spontaneity on some Thursday or other, they organize the Tamarind Feast and on the avenue on Tamarind feast on the avenue you're foolishly trying to cross. In a landscape where orientation is almost impossible, a wrong turn constitutes a mere test. Making mistakes gives us confidence, and if you detect it and say that's not the way, you confirm that there actually is a way, and a goal that exists. <laughs> the territory exceeds us in such a way it's better to ignore certain things. Not knowing how many of us there are can upset visitors, but not us, because we're convinced that the margin of error is never completely wrong, because it announces the possibility of reaching something that is not an error. So, how about navigating around the galaxy? <laughs> so, um, yeah, and and if you know, notice your own your own heart and your own mind, the immense multiplicity of it. The um, I remember when I first took up koans, I realized that the, in the orthodox uh, koan curriculum, there are like 1,700 koans, you know. 
And it depends what you call a koan and so on like that. But some of the koans have like three koans inside them and things. But and I thought, and I had very much had the idea that koans were for, you know, cultivate, providing both a vessel and a, and a sort of catalyst for awakening, which is you know, one of the uses. And so if you really hang out with a koan, in some way, you know, you walk into a door one day and wake up, or you're in the shower or something like that, and you wake up in some way, and, and your understanding of life is really different. And it's a kind of nice thing to know about that. Um, but, but the other thing that koans do is really, the reason there are so many of them, it's like galaxies. It's like each one of them contains, you know, a fragment of awakening, and you might bump into any of them. And also you might learn more and more just by the different bits of the koans, you know. So, so that each branch of coral holds up the moon, which <clears throat> I like because I'm a sucker for romantic lyric images <laughs> and uh, and then I think of like traveling over the in Australia in North Queensland in Australia the coral sea goes really up to the islands you know the the uh, the islands to the east of Papua New Guinea and and you can and I've steamed over them in in old old wooden fishing boat actually and other other equally fragile vessels and um and you know wherever you are, like there's just coral and more coral, and each in each of them there's the the if you look in the moonlight is there, and also the the golden fish and the sharks and the, just the beauty of it, you know, is there. And uh, and also the possibility that you'll run into some part of the reef you don't know well and just tear a hole in the bottom of the boat, you know. So. It was something we didn't actually think about, which was good because we, we had no lifeboats, dinghies, no, <laughs> nothing like that, you know. But we'd been around, we sort of trusted our feel for the for the ocean and the currents and things. So, so yeah, so um, so you can, t so there's a, the coral is an image for the multiplicity, how everything, you know, these tiny little creatures make this huge structure and then it's alive just at the tips, you know, with the moon, moonlight. And, uh, and all of us make this huge thing, and we're all the tips. We're, we're alive at the whole reef. And the uh, the the original, it was a call and response, but a student had an awakening experience, and the idea was you're supposed to say some profound <coughs> poem about awakening, like um, Sudung Po's, you know, 84th last night I had 84,000 verses. How will I remember them tomorrow? You know, I'm supposed to say things like that. Um, and uh, but he he didn't he he had a series of uh, questions and answers and the question that went with this one was what is the sharpest sword so that is like what does that mean this is itself a question you know something to sit with what is the sharpest sword you know what gives understanding and cuts through things you know so um, and, and the, you know then you then then you're in the image realm. You know, with swords and things that cut, and dreams about swords and stuff like that. And people who are getting, becoming teachers, you know, they're doomed and they can't escape the fate of being a teacher. <laughs> they're, um, they sometimes dream about swords and, or getting and receiving a sword or something like that. So, um, so this stuff gets into the deep, the depths of the soul, really. So yeah, so so that's the. <clears throat> that koan and uh, and you'll feel like everywhere the each particular thing you look at contains the whole galaxy contains the universe and um, and so you know it's a great thing to to discover and to know that you have a part of all this and so the old teacher said you weren't born and you cannot die a strange thing. Why is it consoling to think I wasn't born? You know, what's that could got to do with I can't die? But you can feel when you meditate, you can feel the truth of these things. That in the here, when you're here, you've always been here. It's kind of, and if you're content to be here, that's what meditation gives us. It's not 
some extra thing to believe or think about. In fact, it's better not to bother believing things because then you'll just have to lose them. So instead of that, we're just here. It's kind of marvelous. Um, and uh, and so I want to read just a couple of other little things here. Um, this is um, Walter Benjamin, who's the you know a great kind of scholar of the between the great wars of the 20th century, and he thought about he thought about he his big shaggy dog book. Which, which he's trying to get at everything he understands and knows into you know? and uh, and he didn't make it through the war but um and uh, and he says say something about the method of composition itself the creative process how everything one is thinking at a specific moment in time must at all costs be incorporated into the project then at hand so whatever you're thinking now is something to do with your project it's rather a wonderful idea because you know um, you don't have to worry so much whether you're thinking the right thing. You just assume this must be the right thing. <laughs> and uh, Ma Master Ma, Great Ma Zhu, you know, who's quite right at the head of the right near Linji and right at the head of the Linji was the student of his student you know, um, of the Koan, Great Koan tradition, and he said. The whole meaning of your life is contained in this current moment, in the matter at hand. You know, the whole meaning of your life is contained in the matter at hand. And it's kind of, it's incredibly liberating because you don't have to go and find a meaning somewhere else. You know, when you've you know, given up whatever you've given up or acquired whatever you're trying to acquire. And those things are just by the way. You're really here and being here is enough. And just like it's enough for the galaxy to be there. We've no idea whether those galaxies in the James Webb field, deep field, are. what is the meaning of being a galaxy? How am I doing as a galaxy? <laughs> Things like that. But you can tell that, you know, just the universe is just pouring through them and becoming them. And, uh, and here's another tiny little piece. This is Yuda Amachai things that have been lost the thing about the fragments from newspaper columns and notice boards i find out about things that have been lost this way i know what people had and what they love once my tired head fell on my hairy chest and i found there my father's smell again after many years my memories are like someone who can't go back to Czechoslovakia or who is afraid to return to Chile. Sometimes I see again the white vaulted room with the telegram on the table. So um, let's sit some more, you know, with all that. And just like uh, each coral branch, each branch of coral holds up the moon. It's your, the moon is for you, it's with you, yeah? So, um, let's have here, let's be here. I found the striker for, speaking of small things, I found my, my, I've been sitting outside a lot, and, and so uh, we have bunch, a few of us here, and, um, and the, the striker disappeared because the raccoons <laughs> moved it, you know, and so I just found it just in time. So here it is. So now I can really enjoy the striker. It's not something I take for granted. Kind of fun. I presume it was the raccoons, but I don't know. Foxes move things. Other things move things too. The sound of the temple bell. Each branch of coral holds up the moon. Each thought, each piece of your heart. 
All the things you think are mistakes, they brought you here. And perhaps your whole life is golden. Or at least bright like moonlight. And so just let it come to you and don't, you know, don't try to make your mind calm. Well, you can try to make your mind calm, which was certainly my strategy for a long time. And eventually you'll become calm. Or you can not try to make your life calm, your, your mind calm, and it will eventually become calm. So um, there are different kinds of ways, there are legitimately different ways to, you know, feel the world and find out where your feet are naturally stepping. There are a lot of meditations about where are my feet naturally stepping. And then you just notice each branch of coral holds up the moon. As you just sink down, each branch of coral holds up the moon. And, you know, if you want to, I don't know that we need a lot of technique, but if you want a technique, just start, each branch of coral holds up the moon. Just, you know, if you say it to yourself and then you'll find, perhaps you don't need to, you just have a feeling for the coral or an image of the moonlight and you feel the like moonlight's inside your heart. And pretty soon the coral will start taking care of you and freeing you from the burden of, of your life, really. But freeing you from having to perform you. It's just the universe appearing inside you and through you.
Each branch of coral holds up the moon. Our hawk um, often appears <laughs> during, I was going to say during meditation, but just often appears anyway. <laughs> and she likes us, she hangs around near us. And I think she likes two things. There's a kind of temple feel around here, and she'll fly quite close to us or perch close to us or try and fit herself in the bird bath, for which she's vastly too big. And also, she likes the gophers. <laughs> Very fond of a good gopher. <laughs> right to roll the, the airplane, you know, the hawk. Each branch of coral. Nothing is needed when you're sitting, you know. It's a good thing. The universe is enough. There's enough galaxies for us. <laughs> and how would we know if we needed one more? <laughs> One of our uh, blessings for the end of Session says, the hawk cries out again and again, in this life we will not be alone.
I don't know whether that's needed, but if it is, it's good to be really patient with yourself. And realize that all impatience in meditation is really about me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, ah, I don't know. It doesn't seem to help to be impatient, you know. It doesn't help me do the delicate task of being here. When I first began meditation, I was so, I just was so impatient. I had such great, you know, heat and steam and forces working inside me. I thought meditation would help, and it did, but sometimes in a long retreat, it was kind of hard, and I, I trick myself into staying by saying I'll wait till the meditation period ends before I punch out the wall in front of me so, <laughs> so you know but it wasn't necessary to even wait right here I was already free but in a certain sense being patient I gradually Gradually, the meditation taught me how to meditate. And then, I've always had that. Each branch of coral holds up the moon. And sometimes we're nourished by that which we cannot see. And the hidden, the hidden forces of kindness are at work on us. And we get help that we were not expecting. Which is in a way almost better than the help we were expecting. <laughs> it just comes out of the universe and it's none of our business. So you notice how the bell is inside us as well as wherever else it is. It's a nice thing. And when we're meditating, after a while we don't need to hold our I'm good at meditation thing, or I'm doing meditation so that my mind will do X. Because if we're part of the universe, it's really, it's up to like Stefan's quintet and the web deep field and things like that to do that for us <laughs> and we don't have to worry and even if we get sick well the universe is just doing that for us so, and uh, we can uh, Mazu also said through many eons through countless universes really but through uh, through countless eons no one has ever fallen, no being has ever fallen out of the samadhi, the deep meditation. No being has ever fallen out of the samadhi of Buddha nature. So there you go. Good to know. <laughs> Lucky we were informed. <laughs> I'm going to get a few other people to say something here. Um, Alison, do you have anything to say? Uh, sure, yeah, I like what you just said about the no being has ever fallen out of the deep samadhi of meditation. And a couple things. Um, what? The James Webb deep field that I remember when those images first came out a couple of weeks ago and I was underneath the photograph of all the stars. And then I read, and this is, as you said, one the size of one grain of sand held at arm's length in the sky. And as soon as I read that, it did, it was very much like the experience of a Cohen where acting upon me and um, where suddenly my sense of, of the, the, the reverse the relationship of scale to such an extreme that um, the disorientation was so extreme 
that in my normal way of being, m the sense of me and my life and myself and, and, you know, as a friend of mine called it, the world according to me, uh, takes up so much of my, um, my concerns. And the, the disorientation <laughs> was so extreme that suddenly I had, like, I had not, nothing to orient by, and there was such a feeling of, of um, wonder, I guess, or awe, the awe inside of everything. And also the sense of relief of the burden of my own, my own personal life and my troubles was suddenly like take, uh, evaporated. So that was incredibly beautiful. And something you said earlier today, where you said with the Cullen when that each branch of coral holds up the moon, where don't stand outside of the Cullen and try to figure it out, but let it act upon you. And that the image of the universe was very much like that acting upon me, is very much like the Cullen experience, very akin to that. And I traveled for the first time. I took it, I flew to the East Coast, so I hadn't been on an airplane since before COVID. And correspondingly, I really hadn't been around humanity in, you know, in the mass of humanity, the way I didn't, I kind of forgot what people were like um, and what conversations were like. So I was be on an airplane or I'd be at the beach and I'd overhear conversations and I'd see people and I was kind of, I don't know, just a kind of amazement and that, that in a way, um, some of the conversations I overheard, you know, where you feel that, um, the world has gotten very small and it's like they've forgotten where they were. They've forgotten that they were in this and almost, um, it, you can't even describe the awe with which the splendor, with which the strangeness of being here. And then what you just said about the no being has ever fallen out of, and I could feel it. It doesn't matter if people see it or don't see it. They are fully expressing just like, it's like each person was the deep field. Each person was like that grain of sand and the universe and the stars were just inside of them. They didn't need to see it for that, for that to be apparent. Um, that's, that's the view from here. <laughs> Very good. Um, Amanda, you're, uh... I think you're holed up with COVID still. Uh, how's it going? How's the COVID meditation? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> oh dear, my uh, sound systems. Okay, it's fine. <sighs> oh. I don't know what to say about the COVID meditation. It's um, I think I was I was writing something to you yesterday about when I first got COVID, I got such a bad fever, and um, and it was really uncomfortable, but it was also so euphoric because I just felt so surrendered because there's no choice but to just lie back and let it have its way with me. And that is just like, I don't know, it was wildly kind of blissful. And then as soon as I started getting my energy back, I was just flooded with resistance and hatred of what was happening. And <laughs> it's just the emotional impact of having spent these years trying so hard to not get COVID and then and then getting it um it's been a wild ride and then just especially in meditation going into the resistance and 
so much res like it just tugs this whole web of other resistances that I hadn't known that I had the resistance to meditation dislike of meditation um just going into those tendrils and feeling all of the life there that's in the the life that's in the no 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 just so much seething frothing life energy inside of that and just to sit there and hold it it's been wild Ugh. so that's my report for now and also just to to notice the deep shining awakeness that doesn't have anything to do with any of that it's just underneath Ugh. and just noticing that and then noticing the desire to look away from it again and fixate on my dislike of what's happening but then noticing again it's still there just you know staring at me it's uh, uh, yep thank you <laughs> that's it <laughs> thank you that's the moonlight uh, michelle do you want to say anything mm -mm. Mm, after that uh <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, so maybe I'll say something brief. Um, it, you, s well, okay. The view from here is, I think I've mentioned many times that I am involved in a very long search to try and possibly buy a house, but I don't. Um, we're trying to do it with resources that don't actually match the market. Um, so it's like trying to do the impossible. And uh, it, when, when you were describing the horizontal vertigo navigation thing, it's like, well, you just keep taking a step and then, and then you discover that's not it. We, you know, and then that tells you maybe there is a way somewhere and you keep on going and keep on going. And, and that kind of connected with me with something you said later about sitting in meditation and um, watching the moves that you naturally make. And then that connects to me with the idea that there's unseen help. And all of those things together, the, the taking steps, the moving, the not knowing where you're going, the, the, the interest in what is coming through you and what you are doing and not thinking it's necessarily wrong and being still enough to make moves from a place that's deeper than where your head thinks you should be going. And that out of that can come a kind of unseen help. And somehow all of that together was weaving through and also connecting with what's been going on with me trying to find a place to live. Um, so, and as I came I, this morning when the program started, there was, we had just been told by the realtor that like you are looking for the impossible and it will never happen. And then this morning, something appeared that looked like maybe it was the impossible. And there was a lot of agitation. And then just sitting quietly, I looked out the window and saw a big green leaf like waving at me. And all this calmness came over me again. And it was just so nice. So, thanks. That's the view from here. Thank you. <laughs> you ought to take up teaching Zen. Yeah. <laughs> John Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> um, yeah, I was really struck by um, uh, it's enough. It's enough. And it's all for you, your, your eminence. And uh, God, the call of the, the hawk, just gee, gee, gee. And the, um, I have these trump, this trumpet vine outside my window I'm looking at. And just the beautiful red flowers and how it's it's just all enough in fact it's more than enough but um i was thinking also this morning about when i feel that it's not enough you know is that enough and uh, i was cooking breakfast and getting it chopping up uh chopping up some some garlic and you know some tomatoes and scrambling eggs and i reached for a for a spoon out of, we've got this crock pot and a spoon with this inordinate 
crazy number of wooden spoons in it. And it, every time I reach for a spoon out of the crock pot, I think of a friend who actually uh, was house sitting for us and, and he made a joke about how many spoons we have in our crock pot for, in the house he was, he was house sitting and it makes me think of him and then how many, how many years we had it's just a really close relationship and, and, um, and it was always a joy to exchange emails, to talk to him on the phone, to visit. And, uh, and then he had a breakup in his relationship and he moved far away and COVID happened. And, and, you know, um, I checked in on him because I used to visit him in the hospital whenever he got a transmissible disease that I was sure was going to should have killed him. The universe uh, was certainly gunning for him, and uh, and he'd come out of the hospital just fit as a fiddle. And and so I check in on him and check in on him, check in on him, and I feel like I felt like in the last year that that it's just it just has changed, this changed, and and our relationship is is no longer active and uh, it's no longer warm in, in the way it was and uh, how I was sad about that holding that wooden spoon thinking about that and uh, and I was thinking as we were sitting you were saying is it enough is it is it, a, is it enough you know and and in some ways the sadness comes from feeling like it's not enough, that, that my relationship was back to where it was before, but, but yet it is enough, you know, and, and, and it doesn't make it unsad, um, but it's just enough. So thank you for mentioning that, that it's all for us. Very touching. Thank you, John. Yeah. So let's, um, a little more meditation, eh? Um, oh, before that, I want to say, you know, the grain of sand obviously brings to mind Blake's, you know, great poem, Augies of Innocence, you know, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm, palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And it's a kind of great, quite long poem. That's a great start. And the rest of it is not very interesting, actually. <laughs> then he gets into a Blakeian rant about the misbehavior of life, really. <laughs> and, uh, but that's such a great thing. You know, don't you think it's such a great thing to the grain of sand and all those galaxies there? So, Okay, more meditation. <laughs> Oh, if I, maybe the raccoons stole my di No, they didn't. Here it is. <laughs> the sound of the temple bell. Each branch of coral holds up the moon, each finger of coral. Each branch of your own memory and feeling and mind holds up the moon. Each branch of coral holds up the moon. And perhaps you can, you know, the Tibetans who first taught me, um, you always meditate with your eyes open. And I think they assumed you were probably at 12,000 feet somewhere in Bhutan, <laughs> Tibet, uh, the high in the Himalayas. And, um, and that you should regard the vastness. There's something to be said for that. Whatever you see is part of the vastness. The intimate face of a child, the view out the window, the way your 
eyes just get drawn to something. Each branch of coral holds up the moon.
Each coral branch, each branch of coral holds up the moon, your moon. So once again, it's like the music, you just let it come to you and take you over and have you and uh, I don't know, you don't stand apart from the koan. And after a while, the cone is doing your life. <laughs> it might even do a better job with my life than I would. <laughs> but come on, each branch of coral holds up the moon. The, uh, um, thank you, Michael Wilding, for the music. <laughs> Michael was supposed to play in the first thing, and in fact did play in the first meditation, but I didn't hear him. <laughs> Nobody else did either. <laughs> this is really kind of fun. <laughs> and, uh, and so he had to play again. <laughs> and uh, um, oh, here he is. Hi, Michael. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what that was. I don't know. It's just supposed to, you were supposed to get a rehearsal that was unplanned, I guess. <laughs> anyway, thanks. It's nice. It's sort of, you know, when things go wrong, like that's a galaxy too, you know. Galaxies like eat each other and tear through each other. And then the product is stardust, which is us. So. And beautiful music. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, what now? I wanted to read you, um, this is, uh, we've got about two minutes. Yusuf Komanyaka, 
um, Ode to the Maggot. Brother of the Blowfly and Godhead, you work magic over battlefields in slabs of bad pork and flop houses. Yes, you go to the root of all things. You are sound and mathematical. Jesus Christ, you're merciless with the truth. You're merciless with the truth. Ontological and lustrous, you cast spells on beggars and kings behind the stone door of Caesar's tomb, or split trench in a field of ragweed. No decree or creed can outlaw you, as you take every living thing apart. Little master of earth, no one gets to heaven without going through you first. So, um, that poem's sort of more witty, I suppose, than um, deeply cosmic. But he's a wonderful poet, and um, and it's true, we have to pay regard for the very small creatures like maggots. <laughs> they too share, they too are part of the light of the coral moon. Yeah. Very good. Um, so, uh, we, we're going to try and experiment. Um, Amaryllis has a, a person who starts up like garden machinery just when she's usually about to talk or, or play. And so, um, it's sort of like my hawk, but I don't know. Some of us prefer the hawk, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll see. And then before that, I also want to, uh, I want to say hello to Lona, um, who's sort of been around for a while. But hi, hi. you're a wonderful singer, and we're hoping Jordan said that he uh, you he was going to teach you the four vowels or something like that. Is that right? Huh? Um, yeah. Hold on, Thanks. adjusting my audio. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so you're going to learn the four vowels. Is that right? Or? I'm going to attempt to. Yeah. <laughs> well, it won't be hard because you can't do it wrong. <laughs> but you're like Cohen's. Well, thanks. Anyway, I just want to welcome you and say that, um, you know, nice to have you. And um, I look forward to hearing you sing on a future occasion. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be here. Good. Thank you. Now, uh, Amaryllis is going to take us away with music, and then I'm just going to uh, speak the four vowels this time. I vow to wake the beings of the world. I vow to set endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. I vow to wake the beings of the world. I vow to set endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. I vow to wake the beings of the world. I vow to set endless heartache to rest. 
I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. There we are then. Thank you. Uh, if you want to support us, PacificZen.org has ways to donate. If you want to find out what we're up to, it also should help you in that regard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're up to lots of cool things. There's lots of interesting things going on uh, in August when everybody usually does something else. Um, then we have four teachers doing Tuesday, like alternating with a new program that's... Um, Allison, Michelle, uh, uh, who else? Jesse, who else? Tess. Tessie, just Tess, <laughs> Jesse and Tess. Okay, and um, which is kind of cool. And then John Joseph is, you know, still here, even though it's August and he ought to be away somewhere. And he's got a lot going on. But uh, and Dave Weinstein too, and other things are happening. So. Uh, Join it, you know, stay tuned. There's always meditation happening and it's a cool thing. Okay. So thank you very much. And